let me tell you something that's pretty scary in my opinion. The seventh season of Ninjago, Hands of Time, is now six years old. 2017, the release of the Nintendo Switch, the Ninjago movie, Hands of Time, is now over half a decade ago. Feel old yet? For the longest time, Hands of Time has been largely considered to be the worst piece of Ninjago media. No matter how much mediocre Ninjago content releases in that time, pretty much everyone will always agree that no matter what, Hands of Time is the worst. Personally, I no longer think Hands of Time is the worst piece of Ninjago media. I think that title definitely goes to he who shall not be named. But Hands of Time still fiercely holds its spot as second worst. Recently, Ninjago Twitter seems to be really enjoying this season and hey, good for them. If you get enjoyment out of this season, that's awesome and you should keep doing that. However, with the season suddenly being relevant again, I thought now would be a better time than ever to discuss it. So, buckle up for an episode by episode analysis of what I think of this season six years later. Episode 1, The Hands of Time, for such a bad season, is such a solid start. Let's start with the start of the episode. The opening scene is genuinely wonderful and does such a good job at building up a sense of intrigue, mystery, and tension. An aspect of this episode that I really like is the slow unraveling of Wu's dynamic with Acronix. We find out, okay, who is this guy? Wu is here for him. Then we find out they're fighting, there must be some bad blood. Then we find out that Acronix betrayed Wu, but at one point took orders from him, and then he leaves Wu to die. The episode does a really good job at setting up the tension between Wu and the Time Twins, in a way that makes us feel like we're slowly unraveling it for ourselves, which I think is really cool. We get a good sense of what these two characters' dynamic is like, but there's also plenty of mystery and intrigue for the rest of the season to follow up on. However, what isn't so good is the way the episode attempts to set up the other character stories in the season. How the episode will do it is it will just have this incredibly clunky, random, out-of-nowhere, Family Guy-esque dialogue that sets up the character arc. Take this for example. Sometimes I wish I was still Samurai X instead of a ninja. When it comes to dialogue, it does not get more clunky and over-explanatory than that. Like, you'd have to be genuinely trying to make it more blatant than this. It's especially distracting because it happens in the middle of what's otherwise a really fast-paced and, like, high-stakes action scene, in which the whole thing is ground to a screeching halt so Nia can look at the camera and say, Gee, I sure miss being Samurai X. And yeah, this is definitely one of the big problems of Hands of Time. The dialogue in this season is really clunky and just generally bad. If it doesn't feel like it's written for literal two-year-olds, it will come across like this. 40 years ago, during the Serpentine Wars. During the Serpentine Wars? But Ninjago was at peace. What? While we're on this topic, I feel like one of Hands of Time's biggest mistakes is doing this. 40 years ago, during the Serpentine Wars. Explicitly telling us that not only the Serpentine Wars, but in a period of Ninjago's timeline where it's outwardly stated that there is no technology whatsoever, and that they do things just using hammers and stuff, is such a weird choice. Which has progressively got even more confusing with every addition to it. So to recap, over 50 years ago, according to Crystallized, trains were a thing in Ninjago. 40 years ago seems comparatively ancient with next to no tech whatsoever. And then 31 years ago, they invented incredibly realistic and immersive video games. At the absolute bare minimum, they shouldn't have had such a big insistence on the Serpentine War being this incredibly primitive period for Ninjago. If I were running the show, what I would have done is made it be like Season 1, where there is technology in Ninjago, obviously not to the extent of the Season 1 era, but there is still technology, it's just we don't really see it too much. This is the headcanon I used to justify this to myself, but I mean, from the actual show context, they should have done way more to make that apparent. And also, just attaching the number 40 years ago to the Serpentine War was just so pointless and has made for a bunch of confusion. I know of the amount of complaining I've just done, it sounds like I really don't like this episode, but I genuinely do think the first episode of Hands of Time is incredibly solid. A lot of the dialogue and character interactions is really fun, if a bit clunky at points. The animation mixes from being pretty bad to being pretty good, and the overall plot is decent so far. The episode definitely has problems, problems that would definitely get much worse as the season goes on, but just in isolation, this is a pretty great episode. Episode 2, The Hatching, is definitely an episode of Ninjago. This episode starts with Wu fleshing out the history of the Hands of Time, explaining how they came to be, how they can control time, and how they lost that power. Again, ignoring the insistence on Ninjago's primitive era and the 40 years ago figure, I actually really enjoy how interwoven the Hands of Time's past is into the Serpentine Wars. The idea that this happened pretty much straight after they ended is a really cool idea. Also, the fight scene between Wu, Garmadon, and the Hands of Time is an absolute classic. I love this scene. However, right after Wu stops talking and falls asleep, the episode goes down the toilet. 
The thing I dislike about this episode the most is how much the ninja screw around in it. Having scenes of the ninja having fun and screwing around, perfectly fine, good. Having them fool around whilst there's active threats on the loose, beating up people and destroying property, not so good. Thankfully though, I don't have as much issue with this nowadays because Harumi pretty much exists to address this complaint for me. How many times have you ninja failed and let others pay the price? Sons of Garmadon did a really smart bit of course correction here by turning this into a genuine character flaw for the ninja, which Harumi mentions. Good work, SOG. This is why you're the GOAT. Beyond that, the actual action scene is okay, I guess. It's a bit goofy, but I guess it works. One aspect of it I really like is how Jay and Nia both combine their ideas and are able to figure out how to disable the Vermilion Warriors. I think this is a really cool aspect of the fight. It's also my biggest problem of the fight because the hero is having a be-all end-all way to disable the Vermilion Warriors at a moment's notice for the entire rest of the season, this early on completely diminishes the threat. It's a really cool idea and I really like that this happens, but it happens way too early on, which completely diminishes the Vermilion as a threat for me, which unfortunately is a trend that would continue throughout the season. Because on to episode 3, introducing these jokers, Blunk and Ragmunk, Quite possibly the two most forced comedic relief characters in all of Ninjago. Pretty much every scene these guys are in is actively made worse by their presence. And the Vermilion Warriors never get a chance to actually feel threatening to me. Not only because we're two episodes in and the ninja are already running circles around them, but also because we have these two jokers marring them down with every scene they appear in. I feel like Hands of Time is very mixed in its attempts at comedy. On the one hand, you have some incredibly unfunny characters like these. On the other hand, you have some excellent comedic lines. Oh, so all we need to do is round up all the blurs in Ninjago. This tells us nothing! Jay used to be funny, man. The standout attraction of this episode is definitely Kai in the museum, though. This whole segment starts with this wonderful little scene of Kai meeting Nia for the first time, which just is genuinely so great. Your kids miss you, you know? This season had so much potential. So, the big season-changing reveal for Kai. His parents were traitors to the Elemental Alliance. I really wish the season stuck to this. Later on in the season, it's revealed that they weren't actually traitors, and the only work they did for the Hands of Time is work they were forced into doing. And in hindsight, I really wish they stuck with this reveal, because it's really interesting. But we'll discuss the Kai and Nia's parents thing a bit later in the video. Just know that my primary issues of it are that nothing really comes out of it. In the meantime, holy crap, this might be one of the most slept on fight scenes in all of Ninjago. Genuinely, I don't know what it is with this room in the museum and producing some excellently choreographed fight scenes, but whenever the characters enter this room, you know you're about to see the most banger fight scene ever. You know what isn't so good though? The dialogue. Oh my god, bro. Oh, I feel like this scene is pretty emblematic of Hands of Time as a whole. There's so many good ideas and so many really solidly executed things here, but there's also some absolutely awful content in the season that drags everything good about it down. Overall though, this scene is very entertaining, and the reveal that Kai and Nia's parents were traitors is such an interesting one, which I'm sure the season will utilize really well. The scenes with Jay and Cole and Nia trying to reboot Zane in the Samurai X cave are generally really boring and don't really contribute much to the plot. Sure, the reveal that Dr. Sanders' is crux is nice, but during these first three episodes, we've had that same reveal three times now. Do we really need an individual scene for every single character to find out that crux is Sanders? Also, the scenes with Wu in bed in this season are generally pretty boring. These scenes with Wu are literally just a loop of ninja ask Wu question, Wu acts funny, and then Wu falls asleep. Sure, it's pretty entertaining the first time, but when this same scene happens over and over and over again, it gets so tiring so fast. The last thing I want to say about A Time of Traitors is that it could have had a really solid cliffhanger ending, with Kai breaking the news to Nia that their parents are traitors. Instead, they chose to end the episode li like this. Four, seven, two, one. <sighs> This is the ending of a real, non-parody Ninjago episode. Next up, we have episode 4, Scavengers, and this is one of the worst episodes of the entire series. Building on the Master Lloyd stuff at the end of season 5 is the natural next step and a really good choice for the character story, but the problem is we went backwards. If you're unsure as to what I mean, let me play a clip from season 5 and then a clip from season 7. Ronan, get to the ship and protect the people. Ninja, take out the stilts. We need to drop the preeminent into the sea. Ah, oh, why didn't we think of that earlier? That's why he's the leader. All this and now we have no leader either? I'm ordering you to stay. And we're ignoring that order. 
What I don't like about the Master Lloyd arc in Hands of Time is how the character regresses. If this character arc started with Lloyd being in this position where he's struggling to lead the ninja, and then it ended up like Season 5 where he's leading them with confidence, then sure. But the problem is, this is a good story being told in reverse, and it just does not work. I don't care about Lloyd's struggles to be a leader, because I know he shouldn't be struggling to be a leader. Master Wu's scenes in this episode just continue to be generally boring and annoying to watch. And I really don't like the first part of Hands of Time for just completely disabling Zane. It just generally victimizes him and makes a joke out of him, and it just isn't really entertaining to watch. Zane being damaged and victimized like this should be played up for drama, not comedy. Beyond that, the episode Scavengers is just a boring, long action scene that does little to get you invested. You laugh occasionally at the unintentionally goofy moments. <laughs> Broke it. But beyond that, the episode brings absolutely nothing of value to the table. The city's under attack down there. Yes! And the same can unfortunately be said for episode 5, A Line in the Sand. This episode is basically one long continuous action scene where the ninja go from trying to stop the vermilion from stealing metal to trying to stop them from stealing the time blade. A cool concept on paper, the only problem is the last episode was basically just action. Beyond the introduction of a new time blade into the equation, it doesn't really feel like the plot has moved at all. The ninja and the vermilion just kind of fight over and over again with no substance. I hate to use the dreaded F word, but it does come across as filler. I honestly think the events of Scavengers and The Line in the Sand should have just been smushed into one 20 minute episode, because there's so little that happens in these episodes outside of pretty much the beginnings of them and the ends, that they really could just have been smushed into one episode, rather than have a bunch of pointless fighting. Seeing Jay's parents again was nice, but honestly though, I could take that aspect of the episode or leave it. And now we move on to the infamous attack, probably considered to be one of the worst episodes by Ninjago fans just for the lazy name alone, but in hindsight, this one really isn't that bad. It kind of is just another and then the ninja and the vermilion fight episode, and it does suffer from Hands of Time's iconic bad animation. What I appreciate about this episode though, is even though the plot is boring and kind of just a repeat of what happened in the last two episodes, what with it just being a big long fight scene, the episode has a message. And the message of the episode is that pride comes before a fall. Right when the ninja think they've won and suddenly start celebrating and let their guard down is when the hands of time are able to take everything from them and leave them completely hopeless. This is a genuinely great moment. It has a genuine message to be telling to the kids and also has a huge impact on the plot. What with the hands of time getting both time blades and capturing Wu. I still don't think it's a particularly outstanding episode. They didn't win. We lost. What? And I probably would have enjoyed it a lot more had the past two episodes not also just been basically constant fighting. But I really appreciate this episode for at least trying to give its viewers a message and having some pretty substantial plot developments. Episode 7, Secrets Discovered, is a pretty solid episode. This and the attack is the episode where things really finally start to happen. I really feel like Hands of Time could have been shortened to about 8 or so episodes rather than the usual Will Film 10 at this time, because a lot of what happens in these episodes is just the ninja and the vermilion fight for a bit with an occasional dash of actual plot. There's little to no character work in these episodes, and when there is, it's usually not very good and contradicts previous characterization anyway, so we really wouldn't lose too much from cutting it. And I feel like making a cut like this would have really benefited the season's pacing. Anyways, that's already behind us, things are starting to happen in this episode, so let's talk about them. I think this is the episode where Hands of Time really comes into its own. After three episodes of pointless stalling, Kai finally gets to break the news to Nia that their parents were traitors. I really like this scene, you can tell how much the news is weighing on Kai's conscience, and how in this scene, and in the rest of the episode, Nia is outright in denial of what Kai has told her. The characters both feel really believable here, and I like that. This moment of Jay angrily trying to break all of Crux's stuff while Zane tries to stop him because it's priceless historical artifacts is a really funny bit. Man, I miss when Jay was actually funny. The cut to commercials in this episode where all of the ninja make game-changing discoveries is really cool and does a great job at upping the drama. I do have some questions and complaints about the whole Kai Blacksmith Shop mystery parents thing, but I'll get into it later. I really enjoy the story Nia has in this episode and the entire season. It's one that I always kind of slept on and forgot about, but when I really look at it, it's honestly decent. Nostalgia is a powerful thing, and in this case, it's definitely affecting Nia in relation to her days as Samurai X. So I think having this story where she keeps freaking out about not being able to hold on to her past, and then eventually realizes it's okay to let go by giving the Samurai X mantle to a new person, is a really solid and emotionally resonant character arc for her. 
Also, the final detail about this scene that I really like is that Nia of all people, the person whose whole journey over the course of the series is forging her own identity rather than letting it be made for her by other people, is the one telling the new Samurai X that she needs to find her own visual identity. Red's my thing. You gotta find a new color. Was this an intentional detail? Probably not, but I really like it nonetheless. The next thing I really like about this episode is the creative choice to have Kaigo to Skylar for emotional help of what's going on with his parents. Skylar also had a very similar realization that her father is evil and that she wants nothing to do with him, so if anyone will know how Kai's feeling right now, it'll be her. This was a really smart way to tie Skylar, a side character, into the plot in a way that feels natural and in service of the characters. After this, Kai reveals to Nia that he's discovered that their parents are still alive and working for the forces of evil. Nia's reaction to this feels really human and genuine, which I really like, and then Kai drops a pretty interesting look into his character. What does that mean for us? Are we destined to turn evil? I've seen a lot of people bash this character beat because the idea of genetic evil is stupid and obviously not true, which is something I agree with, but that's also what the scene addresses. Of course not. I can get people thinking the idea of Kai thinking that he'll turn evil is stupid, but it's not a completely unrealistic insecurity to have, especially right after your view of your parents has been completely flipped. Anyway, this is followed up with a really insightful line from Skylar that I want to play and then move on. Our parents leave behind their legacies, not their destinies. We choose who we become. And this brings us to the end of the episode, which might I add is a beautifully lit scene where Kai and Nia realize that they're heading straight towards their parents. Secrets Discovered is a really solid episode that has a ton going for it, and minus the premiere and finale of the season, is definitely the season's strong point. And with that, we move on to a not so good episode, Pause and Effect. Now, is that to say that Pause and Effect is a bad episode outright? No, not at all. In fact, it's way better than the likes of Scavengers and A Line in the Sand. But I do have a fair chunk of problems with this episode. In the first scene of the episode, we see... Cole freaking out over a slug! I really enjoyed this first scene of the episode. It's a really charming moment that gives us a good bit of the ninja laying out their plan of attack. And not to mention, this line from Zane is one of my favourite jokes in the entire show. And Lloyd laying out the plan of attack? <laughs> but mostly Cole freaking out. I love these kinds of moments when Zane is just completely out of it and just doesn't pick up on an obvious social cue. It's a really charming aspect of the character to me, and the fact that Jay just completely goes along with it makes the line all the more funny. After that, we get what possibly is the most memorable scene of the entire season, Wu's failure dream. In this dream, we see Wu haunted by all of his worst failures, including his failure to win over Masako, his failure to save his brother from falling to evil, his failure to stop Moro from going down the path he did, and his latest failure, fighting with Chronix alone, allowing the Time Twins to gain power. This is an excellent, excellent scene, and one that does a wonderful job at giving us an insight into how Wu feels at the minute, which is going to hugely play into the ending of his character arc in the season finale, which we're going to discuss when we get to that episode. And then the episode kind of falls off a cliff. A lot of it is Blanc and Ragmonk stuff, with their guarding of Wu, and it's really boring and unfunny, as you can imagine. We also see Cole and Jay trying to free the carpenters the Hands of Time stole, and honestly, this is a pretty solid plotline, but not really enough to save the episode for me. Also, Zane spends half of this episode kneeling perfectly still and not doing anything until Cyrus Bork returns to the swamp, which is really funny. Okay, with all that window dressing out of the way, it's time to discuss the elephant of the room, Kai and Nia's parents. This episode reveals that Rei and Maya were not traitors to the Elemental Alliance, and the only reason they've been working for the Hands of Time is because they've been forced to. This is a reveal I'm very mixed on. On the one hand, sure, I would have much preferred if Kai and Nia's parents were actually traitors because I feel like it would have made for the much more interesting story. But on the other hand, I'm honestly fine with the fact that they aren't. Would I have preferred it? Yes. But I think this idea on paper is still decent. The problem is, the way we get to this point is laughably dumb. So, Crux spent years hiding in plain sight as Dr. Saunders, and then eventually revealed himself to Ray and Maya, telling them that they have no choice but to come with him and forge weapons for him, otherwise he would kill their kids. Except, this makes no sense. Actually, look at the scene. Crux is one man who has no powers anymore, who is decent at fighting, and is being paired up against two of the most skilled elemental masters there currently are at this point in time. It's not like he could even go in for a pot shot on Kai and Nier either, because they are considerably far away from the two children. So, I ask, how could Crux actually go about killing these two? If this scene actually made sense, Ray and Maya could easily disable Crux in mere seconds, leaving him completely hopeless and getting him thrown straight into prison. When you actually look at what's going on in this scene, Kai and Nia are not in any real danger at all, because Crux, if he did anything, Ray could just throw fire at him and he's instantly done. 
So, rather than either of these two thinking, hmm, let's just use our elemental powers on him to maybe slip him up using water or disable him for a bit using fire, they just think, hmm, no, nah, rather than do that, let's throw out our entire lives, leave our children as orphans and go away just for an incredibly non-existent sign of danger. On paper, what we have here is a pretty solid idea for a plotline, but the way it's executed here doesn't make Ray and Maya look like the tragic characters that they were hoping to make them look like. It just makes them look like complete idiots. So yeah, I really don't like this scene too much. The idea for it is okay on paper, but the way it's executed is just so bafflingly dumb that it breaks the immersion for me. A pretty solid way to go about doing this in a way that would make sense is maybe have Ray and Maya be traitors. Not full traitors or evil, but maybe they made a mistake or did something that helped Crux and Acronix, and Crux managed to capture them by blackmailing them. Either come with me or I'll rat you out. Once Kai and Nia find the two parents, maybe you can have their arc be atoning for what they've done and be getting forgiveness. I don't know, I'm just spitballing here. I feel like anything would have made more sense than what actually happened. Beyond that though, Ray and Maya are pretty likeable characters, and I think after that initial stupid backstory, the interactions they have with Kai and Nia in this episode are really solid. I particularly love that initial scene where Kai fights Ray one on one, it's a really well shot and animated fight. The episode ends with the reveal that the final time blade, the reversal one, is hidden within the boiling sea, an ecosystem so hostile only the combined elemental powers of fire and water can survive it. Upon having heard this, Crux and Acronix tell the ninja that the only way they can save Wu is with that specific time blade. So with that, that, Kai and Nia, their parents, Wu, and the Time Twins all set out to find the Reversal Blade. Which brings us on to episode 9. <gasps> out of the fire and into the boiling sea. Absolute mouthful of a title. This episode starts us off exactly where the previous one left off, with Kai and Nia very reluctantly coming with the Time Twins in order to get the Reversal Blade. I really like this part of the plot. Kai and Nia and their parents do not want to be helping the Time Twins by any means, but it is the only way to save their master. So as a result, they're incredibly reluctantly going along with the Time Twins' plan, and as a result, it makes for some pretty tense scenes at the start of this episode. Anyways, after this, Kai and Nia take the Fusion Dragon into the Boiling Sea. The music in this scene is absolutely fantastic, by the way. A detail I really like is how the music gets more muffled once the ninja go into the water, giving the audio this effect of feeling submerged in the sea like where the ninja are right now. It's a really neat little detail. Just so I can say I have discussed it, the B-plot in this episode with the other ninja is pretty good. It's nothing really outstanding or offensive, it's just kind of a serviceable Ninjago episode B-plot. As for the actual scenes in the Boiling Sea, I'm pretty mixed on them. On the one hand, just in this season, and particularly in this whole action set piece, they get Kai and Nia's characters so right. The dynamic feels so natural between the two, and they feel like believable siblings. However, I have two issues with this action set piece. One, the tone. Given the context of what's happening around Kai and Nia, they're currently going through treacherous areas to get their enemies the final weapon they need in order to conquer Ninjago, all so that they can save their master from rapidly aging to death. I don't know, it should feel a bit less fun and a bit more dire for me. Two, I really wish we'd get to know how the characters feel about them having just discovered their long abducted parents. We get a little bit of this from Nia, you know how moms can get. No. But it's something that Hands of Time never really fleshes out, which is one of my big problems of the season. Sure, it's something that Seabound would go on to retroactively fix, but it doesn't change the fact that Hands of Time really didn't do much legwork in this area. Beyond that though, I think the Boiling Sea parts of this episode are pretty decent. I really like it as a set piece, and Kai and Nia's dynamic is really fun as always. Also, I really love how they defeat the- after Kai and Nia successfully retrieve the blade and return safely, Acronix and Crux reveal that they had no intention of saving Wu whatsoever, and betray them. And this moment is where the tension that was being built up in the start of the episode really explodes, making for an incredibly fun fight scene. Ray gets time punched, which will be important in the final episode of the season, and then the pause time blade is used on the ninja, Crux takes the reversal time blade, and then the ninja are left in midair. However, they use the fusion dragon to take chase. Iron Doom is activated, the time twins open up a vortex in time and go through it, and then Kai, Nia, and Wu follow on Dragonflight, whilst Rei and Maya stay in the present. Overall, this episode is a bit of a mixed bag. There's a lot of stuff I can point to and say I quite like. There's a lot of other areas where I feel like the episode was missed potential. Overall, it's okay. This brings us on to the season finale. Episode 10, Lost in Time. They often say that an ending is a pretty good way to give someone a final impression of a piece of media, season, or movie. And no matter how bad your series was in the lead up to it, if you stick the ending a bit, people will probably leave with a good impression. This is no exception for Hands of Time. 
The final episode of Hands of Time is incredibly flawed in areas, but also excels in other areas. And I would say overall is a great ending to the season. It's a dramatic, fun episode with really good action, a really solid message for the viewer, and has a really good cliffhanger. So just to get it over with now, I'm gonna go over what I don't like about this episode, and that's mostly the time travel aspect. I have a really hard time believing that what happened in the past did not change the future at all. Wu seriously expects every single one of those elemental masters, after having seen an attempted invasion of Ninjago, to all go and drink obscurity and forget this ever happened. Now, this is a reach in of itself, but even if this were to happen, the Reversal Blade is already here at the time of the past events, so surely Croc should be here too, right? What's stopping Crocs from seeing the Iron Doom? Would that not change the past at all? I think an aspect they should have leaned more into this season is the idea of a time loop. For example, have past Crocs who landed in from the Time Vortex see the Iron Doom and get the idea for the plan through that. I just feel like the Time Paradox part of the season was pretty nonsensical and could have been built on more. Now, with that out of the way, I really, really liked this episode. Something I really appreciate about Hands of Time is the restraint the season has with using time travel. They totally could have just had the entire season take place in the past during the Serpentine Wars or something and fill it in with a bunch of easy references and cameos. They could have totally done this and got away with it, but instead, they saved time travel as a big finale spectacle, which makes the actual concept of time travel feel all the more special. Beyond the really stupid logic issues in this scene, the battle between Acronix, Crux, the Elemental Masters, and Kai and Nia is really fun. An aspect of it I really like is how Kai and Nia pretend to be their parents in order to not disturb the timeline. An aspect of the episode I don't like so much is the ending the writers gave to the Vermilion Generals. Sure, Blunk and Ragmunk, yeah, the hands of time killing them makes perfect sense, but why betray Makia? I kind of don't don't like this trope of villains getting really powerful and then just deciding to betray their allies for no reason. If they have something to actively gain from betraying their allies, then sure, but they stand to gain nothing from betraying Makia. It's just something done to make them look eviler. Which I just felt was kind of unnecessary. But on the other hand, I really don't care about Makia that much, so it really doesn't bother me what happens to this character. Another aspect I really like is how the Iron Doom seemingly has sentience by the end. It's a really creepy little plot detail and I enjoy it. Okay, it's time to get into the standout aspect of this episode, Master Wu and the themes of failure. Wu started this season by making an incredibly cocky and ill-advised decision, thinking he could take on Acronix all on his own. The consequences of this were pretty devastating. It led to Acronix being able to escape, link up with his brother, and cause this whole mess to happen. It also caused Acronix to hit Wu with the time punch, which led to him rapidly aging and suffering throughout the entire season, having dreams about his other failures. But luckily, Kai and Nier are able to use the Reversal Blade to save him. Quick tangent, Nia getting the Reversal Blade of the past and saving Wu of that was a really smart story choice. Wu has finally come to and has had a lot of time to reflect on his mistakes. And rather than giving in to despair, he tells Kai this. Failure is often temporary, Kai. It can be corrected. And with effort, it can even be reversed. Wu made a mistake by going to fight Acronix on his own at the monastery. And now, he's gonna be at full strength with Kai and Nia, doing his best to make it right. After a while of fighting in the Iron Doom, it passes through the present, and Wu realizes that Rei needs the Reversal Blade now, because he's aging too. Not wanting another person to suffer as a direct consequence of his mistakes, let alone an old friend, Wu gives Kai and Nia the Reversal Blade and sends them into the present, with Wu staying behind, effectively sacrificing himself to deal with Crocs and Acronix. From a character arc perspective, this is honestly one of the more powerful sacrifices in Ninjago. It's definitely not the best, but it's definitely up there, and does a wonderful job at serving Wu's character arc throughout the season. By staying behind on the Iron Doom and potentially sacrificing his entire future, Wu has atoned for his mistakes and reversed the damages the best he can. After this wonderful character moment for Wu, we go back to the present, where Kai and Nia save their father. After this, the ninja clock what happened with Wu and realize they don't have a leader, until they elect Lloyd to take his place. I don't like Lloyd's master arc over the course of the season because it feels contradictory to what came before, but this ending scene is a really solid bit of progression for the character. Seeing him have to step up in place of Wu was a really smart choice. And then the ninja vow that they will not rest until they find out where their master is. And on that note, the season ends. Hands of Time is an incredibly mixed bag of a season. There is some stuff that's done bafflingly wrong, but other stuff that's done so, so well. Was the season a misunderstood masterpiece? Probably not. But I think in hindsight, this season wasn't as bad as we remember it being. It's not particularly great, 
but it could have been a lot worse. At the start of this video, I mentioned that Hands of Time is my second least favorite season, with He Who Shall Not Be Named taking the place of the worst season for me. And in all honesty, after having watched this season again and did this full retrospective on it, I can honestly say that this season could well bump up a few more spots in my ranking. It's definitely not a particularly great season of Ninjago, but I might say it's now my fourth least favorite or third least favorite rather than the first or second. It is still very bad in areas. The animation is sometimes really good, but also sometimes very bad. The dialogue is pretty mixed, usually resulting in a loss. And a lot of the character arcs feel like they could have been fleshed out way more or just feel completely misguided. That said, there's also a lot to enjoy in this season. And I hope this video opened up your eyes to some of it. What's honestly a miracle to me is how watchable this season is. This and Day of the Departed were produced super last minute in the absence of the Ninjago movie, with it being delayed from 2016 to 2017. There needed to be content to fill that gap. So they brought on new writer David Shane, who had no experience with Ninjago in the past, pulled some old Ninjago movie stuff from off the shelf, and gave him a set of incredibly ambitious goals. Delve deep into Ninjago's past and flesh out Kai and Nia's parents, bring back fan favorite classic villains, and do all of this in a very short production time with no prior experience. The fact that Hands of Time and by extension Day of the Departed, were as watchable as they were at all, let alone Hands of Time having so much stuff you can appreciate in hindsight, is really commendable in my eyes, and a testament to how genuinely solid of a writer David Shane was. If Shane had more time with the Ninjago theme, who knows, maybe he could have wrote a truly great Ninjago installment. But as it stands, while what he wrote isn't the best, there's definitely a lot to like here. But Scavengers and a Line in the Sand suck. Those episodes are going in the trash, along with my hype for Crystallized. 